So yeah, I'm Rebecca. This is Natalie. She's my daughter. She's my youngest. Um, we have three kids, two boys and a girl. And can I just say girls are harder? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> she's the one that has taught me the most. Um, she's been the most difficult, but the one that I just feel the closest to. Um, yeah. She just, I don't know. There's just so many, like, positive emotions coming towards her right now. I just, I just love my Natalie. <laughs> um, we are very excited to be able to talk to you guys about teenagers in the church today. And so Natalie has, I think, a really good story about her experience growing up in the church. She's been at this church since when, Natalie? Is it on? Try this again. How long um, have you been here? <laughs> I've been at Lorewood since I was in the womb. <laughs> so a long time. Um, yeah, so she's grown up here. She's been through all the kids' programs. Um, yeah, and ups and downs. But she's doing really good now, which we are really happy about. Um, so, yeah, Natalie has a good story that she wants to tell about her experience and just to let you guys know where I'm coming from, I have three kids that are either just recently were teenagers or are a teenager. Um, I recently started being a leader in the young adults group. And um, last summer, I went to ETV, our high school camp, and got to know some of the high schoolers there. And that was really fun. And I'm going again this year, whether you guys want me to or not. <laughs> and... Um, I don't know, I feel like there was one other thing, but I don't remember. Oh, yeah, I've been filling in at youth group for about the last five or six weeks. And so, um, yeah, teenagers are very big in my life right now, and they've been fun, and I really enjoy them. Um, it is a very, very hard time of life, and it's very hard for adults to understand them at this point because things are so, so, so different than when we were teenagers. Things have changed so much and they are changing so quickly that, yeah, it, it's become so much harder. And so we have to have a lot more patience and understanding. And so that's, that's kind of just what we want to talk about tonight. So, Natalie, would you like to go ahead and start with telling your story, your experience? Um, I would love to. <laughs> so I've completely grown up at this church. It's the only church that I've ever called home and I, my earliest memory of here is being in the children's building, being in a ball pit. I don't know what class that was in, but that's the earliest thing. And then I remember going to kids worship in Club 66, but it was like, it was a bit hard for me because a lot of it was memorizing verses and books of the Bible, but I can't. I could not recite past Genesis. Still can't. I have no idea. Not a clue. But um, I really enjoyed Club 66, but it just wasn't super fulfilling for me. And then going into youth group, I was really excited because my brothers were in there. But it was also something was missing. And I do love my friends. <laughs> um, and I during COVID, I probably had the biggest break from faith that I've had throughout my life. Um, I almost completely stepped away. So, and there was a lot of factors going into that. But since I've gotten closer to my mom and I've had a lot of ladies at this church approach me and get a lot closer to me, I've gotten a lot more closer to God and I can't be more grateful for that. Um, Two years ago, I went to a women's retreat for the first time, and that was a turning point for me. Sorry, I'm like, I'm about to cry, but. 
Um. The main verses from that experience, I think, or like the sermons, were Psalm 139. And it was verse 13, for you created my... For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And that really stuck with me, and it still does. So. You can take it. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, so we've had a lot of ups and downs. Lots of ups and downs. Natalie's middle school experience was the hardest. We, there were lots of times we thought we would lose her, and we didn't know what to do. Um, there's been lots of counseling. Hers, mine, Doug's, like everybody. It, it's just something we do. It's made a difference. Um, I've had to completely, completely change the way that I look at parenting. Um, every kid is different, And there was no way that Natalie would be here today if I didn't change my way of parenting for her. There's still been times where I have to come back and I'm like, Natalie, I'm so sorry. I tried to fix you again. Like, you know, I'm trying to do what I think you should do, but I have to stop and listen and be patient and wait. And so, yeah, we've been through a lot. High school's been much better. Um, we have stories of, she, yeah, no, she hasn't been going to youth group. And, you know, being in the church, that is one thing that, you know, you hear a lot of, well, as long as the kids are going to youth group. And, yes, youth group is fantastic. It's fun. You get to socialize. You get to learn lots of stuff. Like, I think it's great. But do I think it's the end-all, be-all? No. I think that parents are a huge part as well as all the other adults in the church. And that has been the biggest biggest impact on my daughter's life. So I think I just, it's really important. Um, so what we want to talk about is how Natalie's story shows that connection is probably the biggest thing that teens need. I mean, we all need it, but oh, first of all, you guys have note sheets on your table if you would like to take notes. Um, so with connection, we need it not just with our peers, but we need it with all ages. Um, a lot of you guys know that I come in on Sunday mornings and I give a whole bunch of hugs. I love hugs. It's my favorite. (laughs) I feel like Olaf, like, you know, hi, my name is Olaf and I like warm hugs. (laughs) Like, that's me. (laughs) And, you know, most people like that, too. Some people, I have had to um, hug them anyways. And I've had to just, you know, be like, no, you're going to hug me. (laughs) And now Natalie gives me the best hugs ever. And she solicits, solicits them, too. It goes both ways. And it's super fun. Um, so as far as like age groups though, I like, I hug all ages, you know, like I love coming in and hugging Callie and Haley, you know, they're the, they're some of the youngest kids that I hug and they're just, I just love it. It, They're just so fun and they don't look at me weird. I mean, sometimes they do, but, (laughs) but it's still fun. And then there's people like Betty Hall who, you know, she's, twice my age. She probably doesn't want you to know that, but you know, she's, she's up there, but she's so friendly and smiley. And like, she's one of my favorite people to hug. And she just looks at me like I'm her favorite person to hug too. And it just, it just makes my whole day. And so it's like the whole range of ages. And, you know, I just love that we have that range here and that we can experience that with each other. And I really, like, I really want the teenagers to be able to feel that from all of us. You know, I don't, I don't want it to be this divide between us and them. And as so, you know, we have to, the adults have to be the ones to reach out to them. 
And so, um, yeah, we have studies conducted by the Barna Group and USA Today found that nearly 75% of Christian young people fall away from the faith and leave the church after high school. That's a lot. And then the rest of them, they either go off to college or just kind of silently go somewhere else. And so we don't have that group here. I mean, we, we started the young adults group, and we have three people coming. They come all the time, which is great, but we'd like to see that more. And, you know, there's a big youth group. We'd love to see all of them transition into something like that or bring their friends or whatever. But, you know, we, we have to focus on the teenagers in getting them um, feeling like they belong before they get to a place where their parents don't make them come anymore. Um, yeah, so community and connection. It's just so important. Um, from my experience and experiences around me, I find that when that is missing, it leads to cycles of isolation and loneliness, which then goes to depression and despair. And it's getting more and more. You can see it with so many different people, and it's such a hard cycle to break. One of the things that I find is that nowadays, I hear a lot, but I just don't feel like anyone reaches out to me. And if everyone feels that way, how are we going to connect with each other? And then on the other hand, there's people that are like, I feel like I'm always the one reaching out. Yeah, sometimes it does feel like that. But if you say something about it, say it to one of your friends, and then they'll start reaching out to you, and then you're not always reaching out. Sometimes someone else will. And, you know, it's a give and take. But we all have to remember that we need to reach out sometime. Um, let's see. Community used to be a built-in thing. Um, we used to have large families. Families used to stay close by together. Um, they don't anymore. A lot of times they used to stay, like, live in the same house. Now, you know, families are just it's like, okay, you're turning 18, you're moving out, you're going away, and you don't come back. And, you know, and then parents, it seems like nowadays they just get shipped off to an old person home, and, you know, we're not coming back to our own family community, so that's been taken away. Um, then we also have, nowadays families are much, much smaller, uh, half of them are split up by divorce. And then we have the whole thing of blended families, which, you know, it does bring more community, but it also is complicated. And so then, um, then you know, we also have families and friends living so much farther away. I mean, just like my family, my husband's family all lives in Arizona. My mom lives in Central Oregon. My sister lives in Missouri. And my brother lives in Virginia. And my dad passed away. So we don't have anyone right here. We have extended family, some, but, you know, nuclear family, we don't have anyone right here. So for us, this is our family. It's our church family, but it is our family. You guys are our family. Um, because of all these things, one of the things we've learned is that Gen Z is the loneliest generation to date. They suffer from this so much more than we could ever even imagine. And then the other word, the word that they would use to define themselves the most is overwhelmed. So when you couple that together, lonely and overwhelmed, that makes me want to cry. I know what that feels like. But I can't even imagine how much more they feel it. I, just, like, I don't even know if I could stand it. My journey with Natalie um, has taught me more in the areas of compassion, understanding, and patience than my own teenage years. It's just something that um, I didn't really deal with a whole lot back then. And now I have to, and I'm thankful for it. It's been really hard. Um, you know, I don't want you guys to get the wrong idea that, you know, Natalie don't and I don't have our ups and downs. We definitely do have our downs with each other. <laughs> and I get the eye rolls and the, you know, the funny looks and all those kind of things all the time. But 
I mean, I also use her for entertainment and scare her sometimes. And, you know, you do the things that parents do because they give us hard stuff. (laughs) And, you know, we have to make the most of it. (laughs) Um, But I'm, again, I'm, I'm thankful for her and for everything that she's taught me. So, knowing all these things about teenagers today, what are we supposed to do about it? What can we do about it? As the adults, we bear more of the responsibility to reach out to them than they do to us. We're older, hopefully wiser. It, it's up to us. Most of us. <laughs> so, in getting into this, the most important point that I want to all of us to remember in dealing with or trying to make a relationship with teenagers is get over yourself. <laughs> I know, sounds harsh and sounds blunt. Yes, I'm, I'm kind of a blunt person. <laughs> but I actually have some Bible verses to back me up on this. <laughs> so Romans 12.3 says, And because of God's gracious gift to me, I say to every one of you, Do not think of yourself more highly than you should. Instead, be modest in your thinking and judge yourself according to the amount of faith God has given you. And then later in verse 10, it says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. So this can be something that's really hard for us adults to do. We, you know, our tendency is to look around at those younger than us and think that we know more, we're better, we're wiser, we're, you know, we're whatever. They have so much that they can teach us. If we just put our own, you know, our own, uh, I don't know what the word is, our own desires, our own agenda. Yeah, that's a good one. Put that aside and just See what we can learn from them. They have a lot to say. Teenagers also have just as much, much worth from God as we do. So to make them feel accepted and genuinely loved, we have to give them the same respect and attention we give our own peers. Another thing we have to do is not worry about what they will think about us. It's okay if you act silly or if you mess up or whatever. I mean, I did the whole time at ETV and they still seemed to like me. (laughs) Um, So we're going to go into some of the do's and don'ts for if you need a guideline for, you know, how do we reach out to teenagers? How do we deal with people that are younger than us and do it in a positive way so that we can have relationship with them instead of thinking that it's us versus them? And and I did survey my teenage friends on this, though, you know, I got a little help, too. (laughs) Okay, we'll start with what not to do. Number one, not being approachable. Um, Things like not smiling, not waving, not, or, you know, giving off body language that says, I don't care about you. Um, Not acknowledging them when you're standing there talking to their parents and they're standing there, you know, say hi to them. They're a whole person, too. Expecting them to initiate the conversation. We're the adults. The responsibility is more on us. Um, Number two, acting like you know them before you get to know them. This was a big one, especially with um, pastor's kids. There's a lot of kids that seem like they're watched more than they're gotten to know. And this is something that is is really difficult for them. They, they want to be known for who they are, not for who their family is, or not for who their friends are, or their siblings are, you know, whoever. They want to be known for them. Sometimes, you know, we should listen to other people's opinions, you know, like, don't touch the stove, it's hot, you'll get burned. But other times, we don't have to listen to everybody's opinion. If everyone else is saying this ice cream flavor is gross, but it ends up being your favorite, it's time you shouldn't have listened to them. So get to know the teenagers on your own. Make your own opinions about them. And don't assume that they're all the same. Every single one of them is different. Just like every adult is different, all of our friends are different. All of our family members are different. 
So there's no way that we can assume that every teen is the same because they're not. They're all different. Number three, giving unsolicited advice. No one likes this. <laughs> when we assume we know better or know the whole story, we don't give space for curiosity, growth, or trust, which is what they need to be able to listen to us. Instead of telling them what to do, we should be teaching them how to figure things out on their own. It's like, you know, teach them to fish instead of giving them a fish. Teach them stuff, but listen at the same time. Okay, number four, the biggest, the biggest don't is being judgmental. This is the biggest thing that I got from them in their survey, and it's also like the number one thing I would think would be on there. Being judgmental instantly kills the conversation. There will be no relationship in that setting after that. It's just not going to happen. So, little history here. Today's teens don't know anything different than the last 13 to 19 years. And if we estimate that they don't have any memories before age 3, that would be 2008 at the earliest. Think about how far back a lot of us can remember. <laughs> they don't know what it's like to greet someone at the gate when getting off a plane. The Twin Towers were long gone before they were born. iPhones came out in 2007, iPads in 2010. So memorizing phone numbers and birthdays are a thing of the past. Wall calendars are for old people. <laughs> Facebook went public in 2006, Instagram 2010, Snapchat 2011. S to them, social media has always been around. Can you imagine? I can't. The Sound of Music was a classic by the time I graduated high school. Today's teens don't even know who Julie Andrews is. <laughs> One in particular. <laughs> Normal for them is watching a whole TV series at once, but being able to pause it at any time. They don't know what it's like to wait for the commercial break to have to pee and then run back so they don't miss anything. They don't know that. <laughs> Normal is always being watched. Cameras are everywhere and always on. That gives me anxiety. I just, I don't even know how I would be able to handle that in high school. I don't think I would handle it very well. Yeah, you don't like it either, do you? <laughs> Normal for them is school shooting drills. Most of us didn't have to deal with that. Which means they don't feel safe at school anymore. And for a lot of kids, school was their only safe place. Normal is self-checkout, curbside pickup, and home delivery. No opportunities to have conversations with strangers or other friends that you would even meet in the grocery store. It's very isolating. Last Sunday, um, Pastor Kevin preached on being a sympathizer. Break my heart for what breaks yours. I always love that. Um, I would also add, have compassion for those that God has compassion for, and love those who God loves. To me, that gives space for empathy, understanding, and trust. He also challenged us not to be a complainer. Things are so bad these days. A reminiscer, well, back in my day. <laughs> or a dreamer, if only whatever it is. If we want to live in our precious past, just remember what was not in our past, and that's today's teenagers. Talk about feeling unwanted. Now let's talk about some things we can do. Number one, show up. Be there for them. Say hi regularly. Teens are only scary because we don't know them. <laughs> Communicate with them outside of church. Text them, send them cards, follow them on social media. Take them out to coffee. Be so bold as to do that. What? There have been some people that have taken Natalie out to coffee, and she's really enjoyed it. <laughs> I know cards are very old school when you get stuff through the mail, but, you know, some of us like to send it anyways. And are they good? Are they still good? 
What? <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> okay, some, some love getting cards. <laughs> um, invite them to things like First Friday. And then sit by them. What a concept. <laughs> Make them feel included. A definition of hospitality I read recently was making outsiders feel like insiders. I know we all want to feel like an insider and like there's a place for us to belong. Teenagers are searching for identity and belonging more now than ever before. They need to feel that from us. Number two, listen. God created us with two ears and one mouth. Use your ears more. I know, pretty basic. <laughs> Remember things they tell you. It shows them that you've been paying attention and they matter. There's that great saying, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. It's a good saying for a reason. And be interested in their interests, even if it's not something you are interested in, but practice curiosity. Number three, engage in hard conversations. Treat them like a fellow human being, not a child. Just because they're young doesn't mean we can't learn from them, too. And you, you'll be surprised sometimes. Be open-minded. Try to find out where they're coming from. What have they experienced in life so far? Ask questions with the intent to understand, not to change their mind. And then share your own hard experiences. Vulnerability opens doors Secrecy builds walls. I've heard a lot of people um, sharing their experiences with those younger than them lately, and amazing things have been happening. It's been really cool to see. Number four, build trust. This is really important. Teenagers won't listen to you until they trust you. Do what you say you're going to do and follow through. Keep their confidences Make sure they know that you're not going to blab back to their parents or anyone else for that matter. Think about what a safe and inviting space looks like to you and then be that. So now I want to quickly share a few things with specific groups of people. Just real quick. For the teens, as old people do have worth. <laughs> We may not be trendy, have the right social media apps, know the current slang. I think you guys probably don't even use the word slang anymore. <laughs> or even be as smart as you in certain areas, but we can still provide friendship and community. And you never know, there's a chance I might not be another boring old mom. <laughs> be open to getting to know us like you want us to be open to getting to know you. Some of us are a little fun, you know, or at least you can laugh at us, you know. <laughs> and please give us multiple chances, especially if we're trying to understand. It takes a lot longer to teach old dogs new tricks. We're trying. For the parents of teens, don't be afraid to ask for help. Teenage years are hard. You've moved from physical parent. Yeah, physical parenting to mental parenting. And it's a whole different instruction manual. It's like you're starting over, and it's hard. The other thing is that other adults have worth in your kids' lives. Don't be afraid to ask them to mentor your kids. You might get some no's. You might get a lot of no's. Keep asking. Ask other people. Some, at some point, you'll get some yeses. For all the adults, be yourself, awkwardness and all. And don't get hung up on making a checklist of, you know, having to be a certain age or having a certain hairstyle or clothes or, you know, uh, being on certain social media apps or whatever. I'm someone who I'm not on social media at all. Um, for me, it's, it might be TMI, but I'm I need just like go, an alcoholic going to a bar. It's just not good for me, so I'm not on there. But I'm okay with that. And if teens, you know, if that's some way they connect, we'll find a different way. It's okay. You can find something else. And yes, even with my kids and everyone else, 
I often have no idea what they're talking about. Especially with social media stuff. I mean, I'm like so far out of the loop. But it's all right. <laughs> they can just sit there and laugh at me and be like, oh, mom. <laughs> but they still accept me for me. Um, in Brant Hansen's newest book, Life is Hard, God is Good, Let's Dance, he says, a good part of loving people is about our own willingness to be awkward. To serve people is to make yourself vulnerable. To interact with other humans is risky. To put your heart into anything is to face exposure. People just want real. When you give up trying to be impressive, you can finally speak into someone's life as a friend. And I love all of that. Now, for those of you who have tuned out at all, you can come back for the TLDR version. If you're too old to know, that's the too long didn't read version. <laughs> See, there were only a couple chuckles. <laughs> You're welcome. Are teenagers hard? Yes. Is being a teenager hard? Double yes. Is adulting hard? Yes. More so than we thought it was going to be when we were teenagers. But it's all easier when we have help from those around us. I don't make a lot of goals to me, they're predestined failures. Yes, I still have work to do with my therapist. Thanks, Brian. Um, but I do have one life goal. Be what I want my obituary to say. I know that sounds weird, but that's my goal. I don't want it to say that I was trendy or rich or accomplished or even a great leader. I want it to say that I saw all people the same as human beings created by God. That I strive to see them as God sees them. That each person has worth and God loves them, so I do too. That I use the hard things in my life to better understand and help others. And that my curiosity far outweighed my criticisms and judgments. Yes, I'm still working on all of those. But it's called a goal. So, have you thought about what you want your obituary to say? What? Yes. Yes. This so <laughs> Going back to what my mother said about being a family. This is the family that shows up and is the most approachable. Like, this is the family that shows up to my orchestra concerts and the family that comes up to me every Sunday. And I used to really dread going to church. I was like, there's nothing here for me. But now I love going to church, even if it's just to see people. Like, this is the fellowship that has changed my life. So, that's the biggest part of this. Thank you all for being that family to her, too. Um, I, I want to end tonight with First Peter 4, 8 through 11. <clears throat> Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen.